Hello, friends, and welcome to the 60th episode of All New Snap Judgments. As always, I'm Roy Rogers, and joining me today is my friend and yours, the CEO of the Snap Judgments Podcasting Network, the, the emperor of exaggerated thumbnails and YouTube titles himself, the one, the only, Aaron Pulse Glazer. Glazer, how are you doing on this wonderfully drama-free week here in the Marvel Snap universe? I'm doing quite well. I'm, in fact, totally effing busted. So <laughs> things are going absolutely great over here. I just got back from the Bahamas. I had a wonderful vacation and came back to a bit of a whirlwind. But outside of that, <laughs> pretty happy. Uh, we'll be at a wedding tomorrow for a good work friend and enjoying myself. How about you? Busy, busy, busy. Uh, I'm back to school before we know it. Locking life up before my wife and I go on our annual trip to Canada, where she is from. So this will be... I have one more episode before I will be on a brief sabbatical. So, so haters can only have to deal with me for one more episode for, uh, before you get a little bit of a break. But, Aaron, who are our effing busted special guests this week who will be joining us to discuss Marvel Snap? I just, as you were talking, talked myself out of doing his logo saying thing because I'm going to do it no justice. But you know him. You love him. He's, um, I think, without like exaggeration, the best deck builder and player of the largest Marvel Snap content creators. It's Binks. How you doing, Binks? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for the, the pleasant and very nice compliments. Uh, I'm doing very well today. Uh, it, it's been really good. I'm excited to sit here with, with you folks and talk some Marvel Snap. Cool. And Binks, should any of our viewers currently be under a stone and not know how to find you, how could they do so? Yeah, Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, Binks, B-Y-N-X underscore plays. Uh, you can find a bunch of really cool stuff there. Uh, try and play mostly my own decks, different off-meta cool things uh, all the time. Really good stuff. Awesome. And our other guest is the secret sauce deck builder of the Marvel Snap community. As long as Arishem isn't everywhere, now he's mostly just the secret sauce rager of Arishem decks of the Marvel Snap community. But usually... Uh, my, all of my secret best brews come from the one and only Ika. How you doing, Ika? I'm doing well. Happy to be here. Uh, looking forward to talking about a bunch of stuff. I grinded a bunch today to to be ready. <laughs> to ready to talk, talk about the new cards. So, yeah, I'm ready to go. And how could our people find you? Uh, Ika underscore MTS. That's my Twitch. That's where I stream. You can find the, the spicy cooking... Uh, shows there and uh, on twitter i post my decks and memes on ika's underscore show and ika when do you have your deck ideas when do i have them mm -hmm. oh am I, is it, am I supposed to answer this I don't oh, you don't remember <laughs> the other day i was on your stream and you were just like you know i was in the shower and oh. I started to have this deck idea, I, and then I, 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 I yeah. played right. like, in bed. As the person who has to click the level of adult content in our <laughs> YouTube videos, I'm going to transition us right now to talking about our socials, where uh, our loyal listeners and loyal viewers can engage with us. All right, if you would like to find information about the latest effing busted videos and podcast episodes and deck lists, you should follow us on Elon Musk's Hell site, which really did break for me this week, which was very frustrating. So we are on Twitter at SnapJudgeCast. We are incredibly grateful each and every week to be the official podcasting partner of Marvel Snap Zone. Marvel Snap Zone is the premier website for everything you want to know about Marvel Snap. Its writers include... Paul Glazer over there, but also many frequent guests of the show, friends of the show, Lauren, Dan, many, many others. So all we ask is that you click the link to their Discord, which is linked in the description of this episode on YouTube or in your friendly neighborhood podcast uh, catcher, excuse me, where you can join the best large Discord in all of Marvel Snap. So please go engage with us, support us, and support our friends over at Marvel Snap Zone by joining their Discord. If you want to use the internet equivalent of snail mail, 
to find out about the latest effing busted decks and other content in Marvel Snap, you can email us at snapjudgmentspodcast at gmail.com. But last, but almost, well, I guess almost last, but definitely not least, would probably be the best way to put it, actually, is our YouTube uh, at Snap Judgments Pod, where six out of the seven days a week, including when he's on vacation in the Bahamas, Glazer is out there grinding daily snap take contents. Of course, Saturdays are the day that this podcast is released. So six out of the seven days, you can find high quality content over on the YouTube. Glazer, if our loyal listeners would become loyal viewers of our YouTube channel, what would they find on the YouTube right now? Two videos I'd like to shout out. Um, first, I went and found every top player except one. Uh, that hit number one on the infinite leaderboard going back to when the infinite leaderboard started and i found what deck they played predominantly in their season i did a historical retrospect with marvel snap uh i think it's fairly unique and pretty cool and it's a good way to understand better where we are and yesterday um well i guess two days ago on as of this is released i did a big statistical um or a big look at Arisham and why it is so successful and why the numbers belie how successful it's been in marvel snap Really, really cool. Great stuff over at the YouTube. The last thing that we got to tell you is, of course, about the Patreon. So the Patreon, you know, some folks, Patreons can sometimes, I'm, I'm a Patreon subscriber, patron, whatever, to several things. Sometimes they can feel a little pyramid schemey, but ours is a reverse pyramid scheme because the real point of the Snap Judgments Patreon, which is patreon.com slash Snap Judgments, is so that Glazer can justify to his amazing spouse and small, small child that he is spending money on the Marvel Snap community, that he's sponsoring events, that he's sponsoring tournaments like the uh, Snap Judgments League, like the regular tournaments that launch hosted by Gunny T over at the Snap Judgments Discord. Like these are all things that Glazer can only justify thanks to your support on the Patreon. So for as low as $1, you can get access to things like the Snap Judgments League, early content, all this kind of stuff, and help justify Glazer running up his credit card debt each and every month to support the Marvel Snap community. So that is the end of our sort of shout outs to the various social medias. And we're going to jump right into first impressions of Copycat. So for those of you who don't know about this card yet, which took me four, yes, four spotlight caches to open. Very frustrating, but I did get Call Obsidian, which I didn't have before. So hey, you know, uh, it is what it is. So Copycat is a 3-5, Series 5, 6K token. What does she do? Well, when you draw this, steal the text from the bottom card of your opponent's deck. Thanks. Thoughts about Copycat? So Copycat is interesting, right? Because it's not really an archetypal card. It's just a generally good card that you would put in your deck if your deck needs a three drop and you're trying to have something to do. Uh, So before Copycat came out, when people were asking me, should I buy this card? Should I be saving for this card? I said there's one of three things that can happen because there's already two other three drops that really fit that bill. You have Red Guardian, which is just, you, you know, probably one of the highest floor tech cards in the whole game and Nocturne, which just does so much for you. It's a good body that can move and it can change locations, so it kind of does like everything for you. So I said there's one of three things that are going to happen when this card comes out. Either she's going to be worse than Red Guardian and Nocturne, at which point you can pretty easily skip her because you're not going to really want to throw in any deck unless you want three really good three drops. Obviously, she could be a surfer card. She she has the number three in her cost. Uh, she can be about the same or like a little bit better than uh, Nocturne, Red Guardian, at which point it's kind of hard to want to invest resources in this card when you can so easily swap her out in so many decks with either Nocturne or Red Guardian. Uh, or the third situation would be she would be much better than those, and, and she is a, a good thing to buy because she is the premier of those three cards to be your just kind of plug-and-play three-drop. After playing with her a little bit, I'm not 100% sure on her. I think, unfortunately, from what I've played, I think she falls in the first option, where she is the third best of those three cards, unfortunately. Uh, I really just think that Red Guardian and Nocturne give you more. Uh, Copycat gives you some really good information, which can be cool, but with Arishim running around, the information you get is kind of a bit meaningless, and sometimes, uh, half the time, it's just a random card, right? Um, 
And, you know, the power can be really good or it can just be nothing. And then you just have like a three five that it doesn't do very, very much in your deck. So uh, I think that overall, she's a cool card. She is probably really good in Surfer because she's just a really, really good three drop. Uh, but overall, I think she's like somewhat easy to pass uh, on. She's fun. She's she's cool. She's interesting. But if you're looking to penny pinch with your resources, she's not really going to break the mold or, or open up any decks for you. That was a phenomenal day. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, I really like this card. I'm I'm a, I'm a little bit on the opposite end. Interesting. Um, yes the 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 meta is not good for this card right now. If you're running into a lot of Arishems, yes, it's just like it's kind of a useless card. Uh, there is a little bit of a deck restriction. I'm gonna I'm gonna point this out. If, uh, a lot of people are saying this this is a plug and play, and it is generally speaking, it is a plug and play card. But there is a little bit of a deck restrictions where you need to be able to afford to not play cards on like this card on curve because sometimes you will just draw this card and it's kind of useless and like it's kitty pride and you can't play it so you have to wait till turn six to play this right you can't you have to have a deck that has other cards to play on curve you have to have like athena mid-range package kind of kind of deck so that if you get a bad hit at least you can play the five power at the end or if you get the better card then you just play the better card and you just leave that in your deck at least you got the info that hey at least they don't have that card um but when it does hit, she kind of reminds me a little bit of like a mini pixie. Obviously, they do a little bit of a different thing, but in a in a way where sometimes you will just get something busted, right? Like pixie, you pixie and you get a one cost uh, a magneto, and you're like, oh my god, I just I snap, I won. Same way, copycat can give you a three cost uh, five power uh, uh, Iron Man. It can give you uh, their Shang Chi, and you know, like, oh, I'm safe to play my game, and I can Shang Chi whatever they're doing. There is some really good stuff that you can get with this uh, card. And don't forget, they don't know what <laughs> you took from them. They don't know. If you took their Silver Surfer, that's it. Like, it's over. You snap, and they just have to be like, oh, <laughs> like, why did they snap? So that's why I really like this card. As soon as Arishem drops down in play rate, which I'm already actually kind of seeing. And when I was playing through the, the Deadpool's Diner, I was actually mostly running it to anti-Arisham decks. So it was kind of good because I was getting their Iron Mans and Dark Hawks and all that stuff. I think this card is really good. But yeah, uh, Binks is right, though. It's not... Like, I would say it's as good as those other cards like uh, Nocturne, but it probably isn't better. Uh, I think Nocturne is still just a premium three-cost card. It's just too good. Um, yeah. She does everything, man. It's just uh, it's a beautiful yeah. card, Nocturne is. So Nocturne is like must have at least partially because Dr. Octopus is everywhere, right? Like Nocturne is so insanely good against Dr. Octopus um, compared to Copycat that like, cop I mean, Copycat can be great here, right? But a lot of the times it's not, it's not doing anything to that matchup. Um, the other thing is a lot of people are running Darkhawk in, sorry, Copycat in Darkhawk shells. And I think that's generally speaking wrong. I know it gives you a greater chance of them drawing up fundamentally uh old leech card but those cards have a fairly specific curve wherein you are very often um you can play dark hawk on five right but unless you're playing like a mystique after you're risking a pretty uh devastating shang chi and shang chi is in like all the decks right now so that means that you don't really have a great turn to play copycat 90 percent of the time in those decks which means i don't think that's where she goes uh, there's two places she goes, one that matters right now and one that doesn't. The mini movers deck, if you like the um, old Silky Smooth Smile, but now it just runs Thena because Thena's too good and should be in almost everything, right? Like anything mid rangey needs Thena. But it really fits well in those decks as just like an extra win condition, an extra thing, because you just often have extra energy in that deck. You're playing a lot of really cheap things, and you're just mm -hmm. trying to play two cards, and sometimes this being your extra card when it pulls something good is great, and even if not, you almost always have two or three cards left in hand, so you're perfectly fine just leaving it there. Uh, the other place that's really great is Mill. I thought it is absolutely worth the hype in Mill. Uh, Mill doesn't super exist because of Arisham, but if Arisham didn't exist, or Arisham was pushed down by, say, another card we're about to talk about in a few moments, then all of a sudden Mill is suddenly really, really powerful again. And if Mill is powerful, then I think Copycat is an absolute staple in that deck, because you don't even need to play her to have her do the things she's trying to do in that deck. So, so the idea with Mill is that because they basically end up drawing all their cards, they're going to have their last car that would normally be a real draw kind of be a dead draw because it's leached uh, with it? 
That's, that's right. really and, interesting. Well, and also sometimes you don't get that last card, right? Like you get them down to the last card and you're like, oh, damn it. I, I did all that mill work to, for nothing. And you're like, well, no, I didn't. I did all that mill work for them to get this leeched card. And you know what the value of that leeched card is at that point, too, right? Like, sometimes it's Iron Man, and sometimes it's like, oh, well, I stopped their last turn cord. Who cares? But, like, that is information you have that the opponent doesn't at that point. That is more valuable because now you're sort of controlling what they're drawing. This is the most divided we've been on a new card in a while. Uh, I, 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 like, when Bing's finished, I was a little like, oh, should I have spent all these resources on uh on this card but now i'm I'm feeling a little bit better i haven't gotten a chance to really play with her yet because i bought her sort of like late last night um when i was like am i gonna do this and i was like you know what this was my plan at the beginning of the month i was gonna buy copycat she seems to be the most generically good i've missed out on two of the more generically good cards recently i don't have nocturne or red guardian so i was like you know what i'm not missing out on the generically good card this i'm not going to talk myself out of it this time and so i bought it um and i'm excited to play with it tonight after the show now to sort of like really see where i fall on this uh does anybody have any final thoughts before we move on to the upcoming villain of deadpool and wolverine opening in theater which will be opening in theaters the day the day after the day before this goes live one final copycat thought so if you decide to get this card and you like if you don't have Nocturne or Red Guardian, which are recent high series cards, right? And there are players that don't feel free to open for copycat. If like she's the third best in slot yeah, or fourth best 100%, in slot, yeah. depending on if you have like Sage or you know what I mean, right? Like generally speaking, but if you're missing those cards and you don't have access to them until I don't believe any of them except Sage or Data Mind as coming in spotlight soon, feel free Correct. to grab copycat. You're perfectly fine to run copycat. Um, as just like, this is the best thing I can have in this spot. You're like, so in some large sample of games that will be worse, but on a game to game basis, it's not going to be like terribly different. Now you said she's the third best, but the next card that we're having is also, interestingly (laughs) enough, kind of fits that same bill. Mm -hmm. So we've got Cassandra Nova again, the villain of the just recently released Deadpool and Wolverine movie that you should Definitely go in theaters. That is definitely, definitely why this card is coming out uh, this week. Uh, it's Cassandra Nova, Professor Xavier's evil twin sister. Not a spoiler from the movie. That's in the comics, friends. All right. Let's just be, all right, just be clear. All right. So she's technically Series 5, but is currently available in Deadpool's Diner. What, again, is the bub account for her for the base of her? It's like 1.15 15 million. 15 million. Okay. Uh, and her ability, again, is a 3-1, is on reveal, steal one power from each card in your opponent's deck. So, quick question, because I'm about halfway through Deadpool's Diner towards this card at mo- momentarily. So does this count as a flicked, right? Is this the same? Yeah. Does this interact with the... Uh, a flicked, but she the, gains. But she Scorpion gains. their deck, kind of. Yep. Okay. The, okay, cool. So, thoughts, feelings about Cassandra Nova. I'm in a weird position because I've never, I have never played her, nor literally never played against her. I'm still waiting for the never before seen <laughs> thing to pop up. Uh, I've been playing Marvel Rivals. Uh, I've been playing Marvel Snap since since Devil Snyder dropped. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna be honest. Um, but um, I mean, my my initial thoughts is that it gives uh, you, you know anyone who puts this in your deck, you're gonna have a, another bomb against Arishem, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, you know, as much as I love Arishim as a card, I, I like having a card uh, coming out like that that kind of like counters and uh, helps uh, keep that deck in check uh, as best as possible. Uh, and I really, I mean, even what's really cool about this card, and again, I'll probably have a more nuanced opinion about it when I see it. It's like, if you play this on curve and there's no drawing and nothing has happened to the deck, uh, it's a 3 7 that makes all of your opponent's draws one less power. On paper, if you play this card on curve, that, car- that card's insane, right? Like, you play. Uh, 
God, what's the th- three eight that pulls a card from their deck? I'm losing my mind. Yeah, you pull, you play Gladiator. You're you're paying. You, you get one more power, mm-hmm. but then you have this huge downside of potentially uh, having your opponent get you know a ten power card, pull out their Sasquatch, and then you're in a lot of trouble, right? So I think on paper, as far as a on curve card, uh, this card is absolutely ridiculous. I think that what is going to be seen is that how bad is it when you draw it on turn six and it's much much worse and you don't actually get all that downside or, or all that upside unless you're playing Arishem. Uh, to be able to find to fit into a deck slot. So that when I play it, that's what I'm excited to kind of see and 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 feel with it. Um, yeah, so I, I I did get a chance to play this. I, I grinded all morning. Uh, didn't spend any gold. Got to the got to the 15 million bubs. When I close my eyes, all I see is bubs. Uh, <laughs> but I did it, and I got to play with this card. And um, yeah, eh, it's okay. It's a it's a good card it's goodcard.com like i i I don't it's very hard to judge this card outside of the bubble that it created which is that it's good against arishem which it is you know you're gonna get a big power card when you play this against arishem but outside of arishem like it's kind of the opposite problem of copycat right like copycat doesn't want to play against arishem this does want to play against arishem outside of arishem it didn't feel that great like yeah played on curve it's kind of nice uh, a lot of people are running like the Iron Man uh, Athena packages and someone got their Iron Man minus one. And that's like, you know, that's pretty good. You know, you, you've got some momentum going, right? If they play the cards that this draws the power from, it's it's good, right? It's a 3-8, it's a 3-9, it's a 3-10 if you play it on curve. Other than that, it's just okay. Like the whole one power with the Ravona package doesn't really make a difference because you play this on curve anyways. I guess you can play Kitty alongside with it if you want to, but Athena, I don't know. Yeah, the th- yeah, yeah. I did I mean, that twice, and oh my god! Let me. Let, I won. I won those games. Well, yeah. There you go. A three nine turn two or three ten turn two. It's just like, oh, okay. Turn three, excuse me. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. That, that, yeah. I mean, it's a good card. I, I don't. It's just it sucks that it's so like it's held up to be this Arishem counter that people getting are getting frustrated with the game mode to acquire this card because they feel like it's a necessary card to have in the current meta that's the only thing that that kind of sours this card's release but other than that it's like it's a good card so i got it and i played it a bunch literally in preparation for this i don't assume i'm gonna play it a whole lot going forward it's not really like i mean it goes in some decks i like but i don't know um it is exactly what it's advertised as it is an erishim killer it playing this against erishim is so freaking strong um i played in a game i played Darkhawk, Mystique, and this. And I was just like, oh, well. Thanks for, every thanks, lane, for, baby. <laughs> thanks for coming, Meta Tyrant. Like, it's just, what are you going to do? Like, have a great day. I've got a 20 power 3 and a 34 power 3 and then a 38 power 5. We're doing fine here. Uh, she feels okay. Like, and against, she's 100% worth running as long as Arishem is 30% of the meta. If you're going to see Arishem mm-hmm. in 30% of your games, one of every three games being like, well, I have this card that freaking auto, like, auto at least gives me heavy competition of winning, right? Like, they better see Shang-Chi. Or, like, that lane is just, they're going to have to commit so heavily to compete with your three that just dominate that lane. Um, in other decks, I think that she's pretty good in Darkhawk and she's pretty good in Dina. Athena likes her because they're running Ravona as a general rule in Athena package decks, and if you can play her for two, uh, even on turn three with any one, you're perfectly happy. Um, if you can play her for three at that point, it just gets you ahead because a lot of those decks also run Iron Man, and you're perfectly happy to have a seven-ish uh, power card for that. And then you can run Darkhawk with or without Athena with this card because you can go um, Rock Slide into this, and now it's a... Um, it's still a 3-8, but like now if they draw a rock, it's a negative one rock, which just seems mean. Um, is is it like busted? If Arishem was not printed, this would be a good card that I don't think is in the same planet as Nocturne. I don't think it's as good as Copycat. In an Arishem meta, I think everyone should get it, and I'm holding off on my thoughts about that because we're going to do a Deadpool Dinger section. I'm interested to hear your thoughts uh, in like a surfer deck. Obviously, we have Copycat and, and uh, Cassandra now who are just very good standalone three cost cards that probably competing for surfer. Uh, what kind of cards do you think are getting 
cut from surfer decks to to kind of swap in this cassandra nova because like cassandra nova i kind of like i mentioned gladiator i kind of feel like if you're gonna run gladiator in your deck that's not mill i feel like you almost always want cassandra over it i i don't know if always but like it, it just feels really close and like copycat so like what, what are your thoughts on like cards that would get cut from surfer surfer to to accommodate these cards coming in and just being at this you know really high power level at a, at a three cost so i think i don't think it goes in standard surfer you're regular just like i'm running sarah or mockingbird with my root absorbing man stuff surfer i think it probably doesn't make that list but there's two surfers it, i think it does um i think any type of negative surfer or wong surfer is perfectly fine having this because if you're gonna like odin at the end of the game potentially just like re odining on this even getting that extra like three-ish power is just like it's unexpected opponents are gonna have a problem with it and if you can negative this you're in heaven the other thing is um zunes played that um surfer dark hawk list and that yeah, surfer that's the one dark I've been playing. List. you've been playing that oh well then yeah, tell us about it yeah, it, it feels good, actually, because uh, because that deck is like an RSM counter, right? Because you got a Darkhawk mm-hmm. um, package in there. But this feels good because then you can play uh, Cassandra and then you can play Absorbing that. Mm-hmm. And boom, you just have two large bodies, just like you would have if you played Darkhawk and Mystique. So if you haven't, if you go up against Arishem with that package, great. It's great. Absorbing Man is really good, uh, you know, uh, partner for this card. If it also works with other things in the deck, of course, right? So it's pretty good in Surfer. Surfer is always looking for cards to play on curve. If you don't get Brood, this is like your next best curve to play on three, I feel like. Uh, but in terms of like the cards getting cut, like in that deck, I cut out Mockingbird. Uh, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, there you go. Yeah, especially now that that Mockingbird's up to six, it it's so weird playing Mockingbird at six because it feels. I, I guess we'll probably get into this later, but it's so weird. Like it feels like there's so many turns. It's like, oh, why does this cost one less? Like it just <laughs> feels like <laughs> it should cost one less whenever you play it. It's so interesting. Yeah, it, it's uh the it's you get snap muscles right. Like when Shang yeah. went from ten to nine, I kept I spent like weeks trying to Shang nines and being like, <laughs> I knew that didn't work. It's just I've done this seven thousand times. So like, yeah. Yeah, snap muscles. Snap muscle memory. All right. All right. So we will move on to the other major change, which we were not able to talk about last week because uh, wise viewers and listeners uh, realized that we recorded before the OTA dropped because of Glazer's vacation last episode. So we weren't really able to talk about some of the changes that Things Nika were talking about there with the Mockingbird change. So we're going to go over real quick the balance updates. Uh, so what do we got here? We've got Blob lost his ongoing. Uh, Mockingbird uh, went up to being a six cost, but now 10 strength. Uh, Hydra Bob got his uh, original data mind point of strength back and he became a one five. Uh, Ravona lost a power so she's now just a 2-2 uh viper got a pretty significant tweak uh she's still a 3-5 and now says on reveal one of your other cards here with the lowest power switches sides uh sauron got a one strength buff so did uh so sauron's now a 3-4 so did rare wolf by night who's now a 3-2 so did hit monkey who is now a 3-3 and then the biggest change to me, besides Mockingbird, is the Lockjaw change. Lockjaw has been unleashed and got a hit on his strength down to just four, but is back to anytime you dump a card in Lockjaw's lane, cards come out. Considering it's been a week since the OTA, I don't necessarily think going through each one of these individually is necessarily like sort of a worthwhile discussion. But I think particularly sort of as we move into, we're talking about Deborah Steiner and sort of Erishim and the state of the game, which we'll get to in a little bit. Like what impact uh, our wonderful guests has this OTA had on Marvel Snap? Uh, I, I mean, I think it's been good overall. I, I, I still think Snap is in a really good place. A lot of people are getting frustrated with Arishim. I don't mind playing or, or playing against Arishim personally. So I think Marvel Snap's in a really good place right now as far as balance goes. Um, the Blob obviously had no impact. I think the Blob was a little 
weird. It seemed a little bit like late, like they were like playing around Irish and meta like the first week. They they kind of mm-hmm. changed it. Now you just can't rogue it, which I don't know. It feels almost like a buff sometimes in in a weird way. Um, the the most interesting to me is the Mockingbird one because I think Mockingbird just feels so much more fair now because Mockingbird just used to be a cheater card. Like a five nine Mockingbird, it was so easy to just play whenever because you never had to worry about Shang Chi. Uh, just crazy crazy easy to just play whenever uh, it got too cheap too fast like it has premium stat it is what the uh, abomination stats but it just gets way cheaper way faster uh, and now it's 610 it, it actually like it opens some cool things up like uh scar scar feels way more playable now that mockingbird is a 610 which is something i've been playing around a lot with because and, and i think is really interesting like in thanos you can now keep playing mockingbird and now the scar gets even better because uh mockingbird kind of takes over that over that level to 10 uh, now is Scar 100% playable? I never, I don't think it's going to be in a, in a top tier deck, but seeing a card like Scar that was like very big when Thanos was popular and has essentially fallen off a cliff, now come back with this card, uh, I think is really, really cool. So I think the Mockingbird change is the most impactful and it both like helps the card be more in tune, but then also opens up other cards, which I just thought was so cool. Ika? Yeah, I uh, I agree with the Mockingbird change. Mockingbird was on the top of my list for the best card in the game. It was simply the best card in the game. Uh, now it's a little bit more fair. It's still, I would say it's still up there, top 10. But, you know, it seems more fair now. Uh, the change I liked, actually, really good quality change that they I feel like they nailed it with Viper. Viper feels yeah. great. It feels great. I played, like, the Junk deck, the um, Sentry and Nihilus deck. It feels it feels so good to have another out, another on curve way to play out your stuff and then junk them up. You know, you got Mysterio. You can send them the bad Mysterio now. Like you know, you can. There's more tools to gunk up their side of the board, which is all you know. That's what that deck does, right? Um, so Viper change is great, and then Lockjaw changes. I feel like they also kind of nailed it. It feels fair. It feels good. Sometimes. Your opponent rolls you when they cycle a bunch of stuff in Lockjaw and they pull out a bunch of good stuff, and sometimes they don't. And that <laughs> that's kind of what Lockjaw does, right? So overall, I like all the changes, um, except Hitmonkey. Uh, it's still, it's kind what? of, it's, I don't know. It's still, oh, it's not it, it feels, enough. Got it. It's, yeah, it's not <laughs> enough. Yeah, that's what okay. I mean. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah. I'm okay. Hitmonkey should be stronger. because yeah. Like- yeah, that's the only thing. Okay, that's that's. What I thought you were gonna be like, yeah, monkey doesn't need an extra hand. That was gonna be like, All right, get, <laughs> no, he definitely does. Get yeah. off this podcast now. <laughs> uh, bounce is my favorite thing to do. Marvel Snap. I've been playing fundamentally like eighty percent werewolf decks at this point. Werewolf is so strong right now. Arishem does nothing for werewolf. Werewolf often gets big enough to contend with a blob in um many lanes. It's it's just so good right now. Werewolf is a real card right now. The extra strength like doesn't. I mean, it matters, right? Like, it's not why it's a card, but it really does help. Um, Hitmonkey does need more. I think the Hitmonkey decks... Like, the Hitmonkey decks suffer a lot from Angela getting hit the way Angela was. They were using Angela as a way to really contend in lanes, and that's sort of gone. So, like, I've moved almost all my bounce decks to werewolf decks. And the other real big winner here is Hydra Bob's a great card. Um, Silk is a 2-5 that has an ability that can be a downside. Hydra Bob is a 1-5 that's ability is very rarely a downside. Like, there's just very little reason not to, like, if you just have a filler spot and you don't need, like, Nebula for that location nonsense or anything like it, Hydra Bob is just, like, I mean, I guess Kitty, right? Like, one of the best, best, uh, one of the best um, in slot ones, if you want to run a one. I'm seeing that meme of, like, uh, <laughs> who's the, the guy who played Aquaman, like, sneaking up behind, but it's Killmonger because he's, <laughs> like, very not popular right now. It's, like, the, I feel like that's the biggest reason why, like, any card like Hydra Bob, like if it starts to get super popular, you're just going to see Tech Killmonger, uh, which is interesting. It's always kind of the thing that kind of creeps up, but uh, yeah, yeah, I'm surprised. Like Hydra Bob's, it, it's it's so weird to play these one fives and like they don't feel that impactful. But it's just so hard to have a deck slot even for a one five. It's just it's such an interesting thing to think about them, like how far we've come since the beginnings of Marvel's. Like if this card came out on like beta, like oh this would God. be run in every single deck, right? But like now it's just like, can I can I afford to play a one five? And an interesting uh, like consideration with like Hydra Bob is like if you're gonna run Hydra Bob at a one four, why don't you just play Makari, right? Which is an interesting thing to think about. But they kind of do very similar things in a way. It's like a one four that's gonna end up somewhere. Makari is a three four. So now being a one five, it actually has uh, some 
jump over Makari is kind of like this baseline free card that ends up somewhere. So in my Thena decks, I really like to run a second one because there's that awkward turn two, turn three thing that you run mm -hmm. into where like if you don't have Kitty, you're just like, shit, I just need a one to fill out my curve. It's gonna, like I need that extra power now. Like I'm losing not only the tempo of that one's power, and this is a one five, I'm also losing that extra um, three power on Thena. So that's an eight power swing over running that one drop or not for on turn three. So like I think that's like because it's enabling that other card or you can just play it on Angela, obviously, which is perfectly fine. And you can get it off Angela, um, assuming that a snap happens in the game and the snaps happen in 80% of Marvel Snap games. So, like, I think at the end of the day, um, there's, like, that in the mover deck, right? There's a fairly clear home for Hydra Bob. Um, he's not, like, meta. I don't think a I don't think a one-drop that's not Kitty, who's, like, the ultimate enabler, can really be meta. But I think he's quite good. Like, he's as good as he can be without, like, being broken. Like, as if he's a 1-6, right? Like, you're just like, screw it, we're in. He's a funny card. I remember when, when he got launched, I there was a bar with no name game, and I played mm. Titania, Hydra Bob, and Snapped on turn six. That's awesome. And it was, just, it was just such a, it was just like one of those plays. It's like, this card is like kind of whatever, but in this one moment, it is just it, the only <laughs> card that can really do that for, for what I want. It was just beautiful. That is awesome. So do we think matter, that right? the oh, nerf to Ravona actually did anything? Oh no! I mean, it, yeah, taking a point off a deck is always somewhat impactful, but it's it's never going to push the needle a lot. I, yeah, like it did something. You're going to lose some X small percentage of games that you would otherwise have won if she was a three. So it did sure. something, but like, did is do that anything statistically significant? I guess would no, be no. The... It wasn't. I don't think it was trying to. I don't think I it was remember... really trying to. I remember when they buffed Ravona. It was a two-two, right? Mm -hmm. And it, they buffed it to two-three, and I was like, "Okay, sure, thank you." Like yeah, I just already to played this card anyways. <laughs> yeah. It was a two-one. It was a two-one. It was a two-one. Was it two -one? Was a okay. three, th three, three, and three, then a two-one? Yeah. That was yeah. Three, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it did uh, a whole little dance. How about Sauron? Is Sauron well, ever going to be meta? <laughs> no. No, I, I did try. I, the first deck I tried actually was a Sauron Blob deck after the OTA. Uh, blob is like a backup because it doesn't get hit by the ongoing debuff mm -hmm. anymore. So uh, you can use it as like emergency, get my Red Skull into the Blob kind of thing. And it's it's. I feel like you know. I think they even said it in the notes where it's like it's a good like a starter deck, and they want this deck to feel like you're doing meaningful things if you're low collection level. Mm -hmm. Sure. Right. Yeah, it's. It, I feel like Shuri's like Shuri Sauron is just kind of a deck of the past. You know, like so many decks are doing so many things on so many different boards. It could be so flexible in the final turns. And like when you're playing Shuri Sauron, you're like, I play my Shuri. I play my giant card. I play my Taskmaster. Like it's very, it's very straightforward as to what you're doing. A similar thing happens to like the mainline discard decks, where like these decks that are strong but can do a, they do a very simple and very calculatable thing on the final turns just cannot compete with these decks that can do almost a similar power but can be mm -hmm. almost infinitely flexible with what they're mm -hmm. doing uh, in, the, in the mid game it's just it's just kind of the game's just kind of evolved past it it feels like uh, but it i mean i'm, I'm sure sorry star still has fine stats which is which is got great stats really yeah that's interesting it's just like it's because no one expects it right like because no one's yeah. like what you're not doing that and then you do it and you're like oh I didn't bother to run anything to stop that because that hasn't <laughs> existed in a year. But uh, I think, like, that's my con it's safety blades idea. But, like, that's my conquest dream um, that they just do, like, weird shit in conquest instead of just having it be ladder but tournament mode. Um, just, like, be like, you know what? For this season of conquest, we are unnerfing Thanos and we are unnerfing Shuri. Go. <laughs> For, like, a season. Just, like, we're unnerfing. Or we're loki will be a three and when you play it like you get this weird shit for this <laughs> mode only go for one season right like and then for another season you're like all right well all those cards are banned go what's best and like you just do weird shit give me a reason to play it because if not then like why am i not just playing ladder and getting 10 times more games in but those i wish beautiful... they did that for deadpool's diner but we'll get to that <laughs> yeah those beautiful infinity borders though oh <laughs> All right. Ready to move on? Yeah. 
I think we hit that. All right. Deadpool's Diner. All right. So Deadpool's Diner will be about halfway over, I think, by the time this episode airs, right? Like, it's two weeks, a right? A little less. A little less. A little less? Yeah. Okay. Well, a a little... Little, it's a little less than two than halfway over. It is oh, two okay. weeks. It is two weeks. But it's a, it's a, it'll be a little less than, uh, you know, and many people will have experienced it the way I did, which is not realizing that if you lose your first game closely, you will lose all your bubs. That was my main sort of takeaway. I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess I'll be back in a couple of hours. Once I realized sort of that, I've been slowly grinding away towards my Cassandra Nova. But I'm actually very interested in our guests' sort of takes on this mode, uh, and I'll offer sort of some uh, end here. But I do want to say I am one of those truthers who lost their first game and then couldn't play Deadpool's Diner for another couple of hours. Uh, so, uh, you got, what do you think? What What are your de- you were saying earlier? Like, you're you had strong Deadpool Diner opinions. Fire them off. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Oh boy. So yes, I was also one of those people who got in the Deadpool's Diner. I'm like, how does this game mode work? I lost all my bubs. I couldn't. I couldn't even play it for two hours. But then you know you you know you realize what's happening. I slowly grind it up. I got I got to the 50 million bubs. I did it. I did it without spending any gold, anything. I did it. It's doable. I did it in two, like one and a half days. Okay, let's say that. Um, okay, so to avoid this sort of situation, this sort of frustration that I think lots of people were voicing, where they kind of got locked out of playing the game mode that just launched uh, because they wanted to be part of the hype and all that. I think that why I'm not sure why they didn't do like introductory bot, play, like bot level at first. Like you play against a bot. This, they tell you how it works. You play one game or two. You get extra bubs, and then you go into the real matches. Not sure how. Why didn't they didn't think of that? That would have been great. Um, as far as the game mode itself, I really wish that for the amount of hype and the presentation. This presentation is great. There's some cool art. There's some funny images. Blah blah blah. I wish that all that effort was worth for more than what we got. Uh, it's just ladder. It, it suck. It's just more nerve-wracking ladder. And for people who don't play this game that much, like I do, I play this game four or five hours a day, I can afford to grind and go into these large stake games because I know that I can make it back pretty quickly. For those people that don't do that, it seems very... Uh, it too, it's too nerve-wracking. It's like, it should be fun. It should be enjoyable. It seems like you're playing these bobs and you're like, oh no, I'm going to lose all my bobs. I'm going to, I'm not going to be able to get the cards because I'm going to be way too behind. It just doesn't, it doesn't feel like an enjoyable way to pl- interact with this game mode. That's all I would say in terms of that. Uh, yeah, I feel like I'm so weird with games. Like the moment a game isn't giving me enjoyment and it feels like work. Like I know a lot of people will play games and be like, I play my dailies and then I don't. And that's how like they enjoy games. There's like four games that they do that. And then they have like, one game that's the main game. I will just never do that. Anytime a game starts to feel like work for me, I'm just like, well, what am I doing? I, you mm-hmm. know, I, uh, but it's like Deadpool's Diner kind of feels like that. Yeah, it's just ladder, except with like a triple snap at the end and this exponentially growing amount of quote unquote pot that you're doing. Now, I haven't played very much. I, I will I will uh, preface that. I've played probably only about 10 games just because I'm not interested. There's nothing interesting about it. Just, just like Ika said. I love your idea about the bots at the beginning. That would have been so helpful. And like, have like you know, when you, you first play the game, there's that like cool thing where like the heroes are talking to you and mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. Like you, you have this like cool, interesting thing with Deadpool and Deadpool can show up and like tell you about how the game works. And like even maybe even some basic base like strategies. Cause like everyone just shows up and they're just like click and then it's snapping and they're like, there's a bunch of numbers and then you just die. And then you just like, wait an hour, give me money. I, I don't know. I just, I really, really didn't like that. It feels like a huge, like missed opportunity that just feels like work. Like there's so many cool things you can do with something like this. Like you could have, you know, maybe there's 10 different decks that are pre-built that you can play. There's like mm. Deadpool's destroy deck and you, you know, all these like other like interesting things mm. instead of just play your best deck because it's very important. And then you're just like playing ladder, but it looks different and the stakes are kind of more important, but also not important and not anything. Now, now overall, I mean, it's like good for the game to have a card that you can get for free. And it's good that there's all these resources that are added, but there, it's just it's just a sigh for me 
of a missed opportunity for something that could have been really cool and exciting and they're presenting is very cool and exciting but then when you're actually doing it it just feels like work and chores a bunch of people who really love poker think that the snap is why we enjoy marble snap and like the snap mm. is nice right like i'm not saying i like the game more without the snap but the snap is a part of it, but it, like the gameplay is why I enjoy Marvel Snap, right? Like the actual strategy, the like figuring out what to play where. The Snap is an extra layer of snap strategy on top of what I ever like. Uh, what I, sorry, already like. The problem is I don't want to like go further into the Snap. I want to go further into the gameplay. I don't want yeah. Snap to be more like poker. If I wanted to go play uh, No Limit Hold'em, I would go play No Limit Hold'em, right? Yeah. And, like it's literally just like thank god they have the like timer so you can get back but otherwise they're like spend gold to buy back in buy more chips so you can play more that's what they are bubs aren't cubes bubs are poker chips and like mm -hmm. i um i'm not a gambler i don't love gambling no offense to anyone who is i don't really like i think it can be done healthily or unhealthy if it's unhealthy then you should seek whatever help you need but if you're a healthy gambler have fun whatever like it's your life right i don't love how heavily the gambling aspect is pushed in this mode. I think that it is the bells and whistles appeal to the weakness in people, to people's um, worse instincts to make money in a way that I'm not super comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Like, I, like it's predatory monetization in a way that I don't love being in a Marvel game that is ostensibly marketed to children. Like, and I'm not usually Mr. Like, oh, please think of the children, right? But, like, this is, like, I know, like, I've had multiple adults message me and be like, this is really bad. I'm, like, I'm not saying this publicly, but this is really bad for me mentally. This is preying on some, like, addictive habits I have. I don't like this yeah. mode. And if it's doing that to, like, adults, then I don't love it being involved in children's entertainment. Yeah. And, and, and... I don't love it being involved in adult entertainment, but... <laughs> and they don't even do a good job of communicating what the value of bubs mm -hmm. really even are. Mm -hmm. uh, because at the start, you if you lo lo get locked out of the game and you for feel forced, okay, forced is, you know, quote unquote forced, but if you feel like you need to buy in to get playing again, you know, they don't really do a good job of communicating like, okay, actually, you know what, if you go on uh, a little bit higher up in the in the ladder of the, the event, uh, the bobs that you get increases exponentially mm -hmm. and things like that like there's there's tiny little details about the game mode that's just not communicated well at all like at all <laughs> you have to go on like to, even You'll today to i was like video. yeah i guess so right like, you have to watch you so <laughs> you have to go and see a content creator's video of breaking down the event which it just feels bad anyways uh it's it's not communicated well within the game mode and the numbers are at some point, the, the the number of bobs becomes so absurd and irrelevant. Mm. It doesn't even mm. feel like you're really playing anything. Like I was in a two million bob game, and the numbers just keep increasing. Like two point one three five. Like well, I don't even know what it means. Like let me just let me just play the game. Am I winning or am I losing? Then let me just get the rewards. Right. Like <laughs> so. At some point, when I succeeded, because I ended up, I spent, uh, I think a little less than two thousand gold. I didn't keep straight track, but a little less than two thousand gold just out of patience because i was like just give me this goddamn card i need to test it i've got contact to make so um i ended up getting consensual vote and at first i was like i fucking hate this i fucking hate this once like i was just like why don't i just play marvel snap instead of trying to play deadpool's diner and i just played marvel snap and i flew up and it was easy <laughs> like not easy but like it was marvel snap and like i'm good at marvel mm -hmm. snap so like it was just like okay i'll just play marvel snap and like retreat appropriately and then if you see that extra snap coming retreat a little earlier than usual so you don't lose play a couple tables below and it became fairly obvious how to go about it but like play it like marvel snap where you um both well you should snap more aggressively but you shouldn't because no one's respecting how they should play this mode right like you should snap more aggressively in this mode because people should respect that bluff more than they are because people are just like we bubs are fake too <laughs> bajillion bubs who cares we like but like you if you would like to succeed in this mode should be playing this relatively conservatively play at least one ideally two tables down from your max table and grind up by playing good clean marvel snap and respect opponent snaps run appropriately win games big when you can and do the thing in marvel snap um 
almost everyone who's climbed the infinite leaderboard knows this, where like you sit around the same level for ages, and then all of a sudden you jump up a ton. And then you sit at the same level for some more ages, and then you jump up a ton. That's what this mode feels like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and again, and, and Binks mentioned this, there's there's no thematic in no, well, no. like the gameplay wise, there's nothing thematic about Deadpool and Wolverine in this game mode. It's not like you're like incentivized to play a destroy deck or there's something going on with the locations or anything like that. It's just ladder. It's just like there's nothing different about mm -hmm. it. So I want to preface what I'm going to say with like on some level, like particularly you mentioned the art, right? The art is really good, right? The graphic design team did an amazing job. Right, like I think that Deadpool Diners look super cool, and like the lead, the 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 reward track looks really cool. But other than that, it's a re it feels like a really cheap game mode. It really does feel like three months ago Disney knocked on the door of all of their license holders and said, "Like, look, Deadpool Wolverine, like we like the MCU's been on the downswing, like." we need like all hands on deck to ensure that Deadpool and Wolverine are, is going to be a hit film. So everybody's got to do their Deadpool and Wolverine tie in go. And this is what they did. And they could do it without expending a huge amount of resources. Like the fact that they don't have a Deadpool voice actor who walks you through it. Right. Or Deadpool popping up, like, and making a joke in the middle of your game. Right. Or like, or Wolverine, like a Wolverine voice actor doing something like that all feels like cheap right and the same thing is with the rewards track like as i started to do better like i actually got less like the first few games i won and they gave me some gold and some credits i was like oh cool like more rewards this is really good but then as i started to climb more it just became like more bumps right or like it was like i would win up like two games and i would win some additional bubs that didn't even kick me to another reward level it was just like here's another arbitrary amount of this arbitrary currency to get, or your currency is going to refresh faster if you fuck up, right? Like it, it felt very like, like lazy. Like I'm going to keep playing because I do want the free Cassandra Nova without dropping the 6k tokens on her. But I was fundamentally like, this just feels like really lazy. Like, and that's kind of disappointing considering how much, they hyped it up as this game mode that it is a sort of like high stakes Marvel snap, but like for what, right? Like, because so, I think making it accessible, which hmm. putting a free card based on this new movie they have coming out and making it high stakes Marvel snap feel like design principles at war with each other. And the solution that they came to doesn't feel satisfying to me as a like a like a lower skill lower level player so i think like the community is reasonably unified except for the poker sharks i i have a whole bunch of people like i keep getting messages from people who love poker and they're like i love this this is amazing and like i think if you really really like poker that's why i'm convinced whoever came up with this idea within second dinner like just loves poker like they have like a company poker night and they were like oh my god what if we made this marvel snack like, because the people who love poker keep messaging me to be like, can you tell me why people are complaining about this mode? I don't get it. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want to, like, make you hate it. Like, enjoy it. I'm glad you are. It's just, but if people who really, really enjoy uh, poker seem to very, very much enjoy this mode. So, like, I know who it's for. I think Second Dinner is either too narrow and thinking that was everyone, or, like, thought that was more people you know what i mean thought that was more people than it turns out to be but you know what's interesting you mentioned like the snap mechanic is like not uh like your or the most important thing i personally think snap would be a bad game if there was no snap mechanic really? i think if you're okay. just playing marvel snap for six turns i think the game would just be bad personally but i i the the problem with the bulls is that it does or it doesn't make the snap mechanic more interesting it makes it less interesting because there's this beautiful yeah. elegant thing about a one cube game turning into a two, into a four, into an eight. It's very, you can see it happening. And it's like this really interesting thing of when you're willing to push more. But then what Deadpool Snyder just does is just like, well, okay, well, also on turns four and five, you just, uh, you just double again. You just do it again on four and five, just because more buffs. 
is is how it feels to me and it's like that that makes it feel less elegant i do understand the idea that it's like poker like because it's like you're going to the flop in the river and each each more information you get like adds more but like i i actually feel like it takes away from the snapping mechanic that 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 happens at, at least from how i i yeah. play the game which is which is oh, it hurts and to and to you know uh extend that thought like one thing i found is and i'm sure this is going to be an experience for people who are still climbing from the lower bob collection right where i am up in the millions right i hit my 15 million mark and i got cassandra no and i'm like okay i want to test this deck instead of going on ladder i actually went into sort of the lower table but i have i have i can i can afford to just snap <laughs> in that lower <laughs> table i can bring this game all the way to the end because mm-hmm. i want to see the interactions with my cards that i'm playing with and for someone if my opponent is you know, painstakingly trying to climb up and they're holding on to their bubs, it's not going to be a fun experience because I'm going to be snapping like turn two, or turn three, or whatever. So right? I, you're you're just, a table bully is what you're telling I me. Just, yeah. <laughs> I just lost two million to TLSG on ladder um, because I wasn't sure if he had Cassandra Nova yet. And I was like, I should run. I should run. I have no idea if TLSG has Cassandra Nova. So I was like, I don't want to fucking just rob him the cubes. I don't, these don't, like, I'm not, I'm straight up probably not going for that variant. I don't give a shit. Like, that is way too much grinding of this <laughs> bullshit for me. Thanks, though. I, this game will not feel like work to me. So, like, but I was just like, do I, like, run? And, like, because I could have run. I had no chance of winning. And I just stayed in, and he won. And was just like, huh. Oh. But, like... I, it's it's weird feeling like you have the thing. How hard do you play? It, the mode is going to get real janky depending on different people's um, incentives. Yeah, it's it's interesting, right? Because I think for me, I think it would be a more interesting mode if the numbers had more like weight to them, mm-hmm. right? Where where it definitely does feel a little like if I grind enough and I'm conservative enough, I could theoretic and I like time. Well, but- yeah. Is, is is like the fun is actually like like real sort of like infinite like is that like time is the fundamental resource that you're playing with and skill shortens the amount of time that you need to get to these goals but like if you are you know a 45 percent win weight person you will eventually like get there you know if, particularly if you just conservative with your snapping and and i think it creates this weird thing, right? Because so theoretically, like high stakes Marvel Snap would be really interesting. Like if the three of you as excellent Marvel Snap players had like three million bubs, right? And the most like my skill level could get is like 10,000. That would feel like a substantial mode where there's this clear skill differentiation, right? But it instead to me just feels like another reward track, like another like your dailies, right? Thing versus this like game mode where it's really going to highlight those poker those you know poker players who really understand the snap mechanic right or those high skill players who like really know like sequencing perfectly and it doesn't matter if they snap or retreat like they 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 see sort of lambie like math behind you kind of stuff right of all the possible acts right instead of this again it just feels like ladder with a different reward track right where instead of at every like 60 games or whatever getting some kind of reward it's now a little bit faster and that i think is fundamentally disappointing to me kind of based on maybe my own expectations of what the mode was going to be and their own like this is a new way to play snap and it doesn't feel like a new way it feels like an exaggerated way of playing marvel snap i guess that might be the best way to to put it um so that's sort of my last sort of feelings about it um so besides Arisham and anti Arisham, have you seen a lot of any other decks? No. Literally no. Like <laughs> it, I, as I'm telling you this on, with 100% honesty, 95% of matchups is either Arisham or anti Arisham. Nothing else. There's zero variety. When you have things to lose in the game, people are going to play the best stuff. That's sure. that, when you have like weight to the stuff, you're, they're gonna just gonna play the best stuff, and excuse, it's always excuse me, I played bounce, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, there's not much variety. I personally progressed through most of my playing um, little movers package mm-hmm. because I just hate getting Doc Oct. 
Um, base, like the, what I found is you want to have a peace of mind in this game mode. You want to have cards in this game mode that you don't have to go, what if? Uh, you don't have to go 50-50. If you have think cards like Juggernaut, if you have cards like uh, Captain Marvel, uh, not Captain Marvel, uh, Captain Marvel, yeah. Yeah, Captain Marvel. Uh, cards that, yeah. Cards that say like, okay, I'm going to win this lane guaranteed because I have Juggernaut. And I'm going to have this card do its thing for me because it's always going to go in the best location. You want a deck like that where you're not, you're going to lose to the least amount of things, least amount of location variance, right? Because if you have moving cards, you can get into locked out locations and things like that. You want a deck like that. And that's the deck that worked for me the best. The one that reduces variance the most. My MVP was uh, Ajax. Ajax was so good. Like, people do not accurately account for how big that fucking card gets yet. Um, but that's a 520s four, right? Like, eight, like most of the time. If I Like, if I play Ajax on five, I've got Hazmat. Otherwise, I would do something else, right? And, like, they're just like, hmm, I will sit there with my, like, 20 to 7 lane or 21 to 7 lane and just play elsewhere. And I'm like, all right, cool. I, and then I just win, right? Because, like, I'm shonging you and Hazmatic and then bye. The game is over. The game is fundamentally over at that point. It is, like, Ajax is so good at stealing cues because everyone seems like certain uh, people are still saying Ajax is bad. And Ajax is very not bad. He's a two-card package. He's not, like, you shouldn't be running him in the full thing. Cam figured that out, right? Where Cam was like, just run it with Hazmat. Stop being cute. And like, 100% correct. But if you can afford to do that package, like, I'm not even being cute and running, like, Hope so I can do Ajax and um, Ajax and Hazmat on the same turn. I'm just like, here's an Ajax. You're going to ignore it because everyone's told you this card is bad. And then I'm going to win cubes with it because this card is amazing. Also, you can Juggernaut in Hazmat, which is likewise hilarious. I never sure. play around Juggernaut uh, every time I'm surprised by it. And I should, <laughs> I should not be surprised by it anymore, but every single time I am surprised by it. It's it, so... it just, you always forget that card exists, even yep. though it's like in some of the, the like <laughs> top tier decks right now. Just still never even think about it. Yep. Uh, Juggernaut's so been nice. responsible for two of the last three losses that I did in Nipple's Diner. It's like. It's like, oh yeah, I've got this down, Pat, and it's like, no, I, no, I don't. It's like, oh yeah, Juggernaut, what a card! Why haven't people so always nice. been playing that card? <laughs> Start uh, main decking like Ultron or something to just <laughs> yeah, the, the <laughs> You're not moving right? me anywhere. Like I, I, Juggernaut doesn't beat Bounce a lot because Bounce is just like all my spots are filled. What do you think you're doing? Like it's cute that you think you can do that, but like you're moving. They can wreck your wolf turn though, really bad. They can wreck your wolf turn. That that is bad. It, it does often wreck wolf. Um, I wrecked my grandmaster turn. Yeah, like my beautiful, beautiful grandmaster turns that's that I had. <laughs> when you finally get grandmaster to work, <laughs> they just, no, it's like no. Everything was set up perfectly. My Glen pool, it was great, but no. Hey, I heard you wanted to move a card. I got you. Don't worry. <laughs> I, I do got that, that for you. <laughs> it moved and it moved to the middle too. Just not in the you know not the before my grandmaster. Oh, triggered. Oh. Uh, so outside of play around juggernaut, what other <laughs> tips do we have for this mode? I'm going to be honest, I have nothing. I've played 10 games of it. I am going to, unfortunately, grind it probably on my off time until I get to 15 million. I'm just not interested in playing or optimizing at all, personally. Right, so you're not going for uh, the variant? Nah, it's fine. Yeah, I think I'm blowing it off, too. I can't bring yeah. myself to. It's like, wait, it's 101 million? And, like, there's no rewards between here and there, so I'm doing it just... What? You don't like the worn-out blue border that doesn't look I, like anything? <laughs> I, so, look. I don't like custom borders. People can do what they want, obviously. I just stuck my custom borders on random cards and I plant and everything. <laughs> like, I don't care about them at all. Um, yeah, I don't know. So, you got tip? tips? Um, it, they always have it. If there's a card yeah. and you're like, do they have it? They always have it. Just remember Especially that. Especially against Arishem. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. I got Loki'd on five and, and my deck doesn't run Shang. And I was like, Shang's the only thing that beats me here. I could totally stay. Also, you never lose in your gamble. Just remember you can always gamble more and get that money back. Never let them take the bubs <laughs> from you. Always double down. <laughs> it's true. It's true. 
All right. Psychological every warfare. Losing, it's really important <laughs> that people remember this when they're playing the mode. Every losing gambler is a great gambler who just quit too soon. Right, so <laughs> that is a really, really like important that attitude. All yes. right, before yeah, we <laughs> dig, digging for diamonds. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we are moving on before uh, someone actually believes that, and our so <laughs> our show gets sued because uh, Roy said that one. So I can't even be like, "Snap, ju- this does not reflect the opinions of Snap Judgments." Damn it! All uh-huh. right, uh, you're two of the best deck builders I know. So let's talk about deck building, and then we're going to build a deck together. Cool. Do it. Okay, so go, how do you go, go ab- What? Go, go ahead. Oh, okay. How do you go about building decks, and where do you start? I think you start with an idea or a card. So if there's a new card coming out, you put that card, you, put, you think about it, and you put it in a deck, and you say, what, what does this freaking thing want to do? Or it, could, or it could just be like an idea. You know, it could be, uh, obviously, you could look at things like Cerebro, or like a Junk-type package, or, you, you know, like different, different kind of things like that. You always have to start with an idea. Uh, you find the core cards that fit into that idea that do it best that you will never even think about uh, changing. Uh, and then you kind of like, I, I'm an inside out kind of deck builder. So I, so I kind of build those core cards that I want to see. And then I think with this idea, do I want to have a pretty standard curve? Do I want to have a very low curve? Do I want to have a pretty high curve? Uh, and then I just kind of like build uh, uh, situational pieces like that uh, on top of it. Uh, as you're building it, you think about what kind of weaknesses and strengths does this deck have. How can I fill out those weaknesses, or am I okay with having those like kind of weaknesses there? Uh, and I just want to kind of go all in on power, or I want to go all in on tech and not worry about power. Uh, but I'm a very much an inside out uh, kind of deck builder. Start with an idea, start with those core cards. Think about when you're playing those cards, what you want to be doing on those particular turns, and build out your cost and your your twelve cards to fit around that. That's kind of like my one minute, uh, how, how I think about building decks. Nico? Yeah, those are pretty, I mean, generally speaking, that's kind of the direction I usually go. Uh, more conceptually, though, I, I like to analyze the meta and see what are people missing? What can, what build deck can I put together that slips right in the meta, counters the most stuff, and is unexpected? Because I, I usually just play ladder, so I, I'm all about the unexpected factor. If you can come up with a cool combo that they just have no idea that you could do, that's great because you're going to steal cubes. I love stealing cubes. <laughs> Coming up with some weirdo idea that they don't know about that you can do and pull off and win is great. Um, but yeah, that those are pretty pretty much how you go about it. I and mean, if you have an idea like, okay, if RSM is common, what's something that that can counter? Obviously, people kind of figured that out quickly. You go Dark Hawk route. But there was a meta, for example, Thanos meta. And I came up with a deck, like a destroy deck that ran token cards as well. So you could take use of the Mockingbird. And I got to top 50 with that deck, just purely using that deck. Sometimes you can figure out what can you counter something, like what deck you can put together that counters the meta. And at the same time, does something that's that you like. Remember, you have to build, if you're building a deck, if you like to, uh, practice building decks and come up with your own ideas. Remember, build something that you like and enjoy always, right? Like it, sometimes people feel forced to build something that they f- want to be competitive or things like that. If you're having fun with your deck, you're going to win games because you're just enjoying the moment to moment gameplay of that deck. So I have, I don't know how to explain this. I'm going to try and explain what my process is like. Um, so the I start out with either a card or an interaction that I think I can do something with. And I build new stuff like most creators do every week for the new cards, right? So like I start out with that. And then I sort of have a bunch of other cards almost in little packages in my head. And in my head, what it feels like, I'm not visual, so it doesn't actually work like this. But it's almost like a little slot machine where that first thing is that package, let's say Viper and Hood, right? And then, like, I'm sort of cycling through other things that I know fit with them. And, like, I'm like, oh, well, if I'm running Hood, then I know I can be running Bounce. Then I know I can be running um, a Cersei deck, or I know I can be running an Annihilus deck. Do I want to run a Bounce Cersei, a Bounce Annihilus? And, like, and I start, like, comparing and building in packages. And then I see how much space I have left. And then with that, I'm like, does anything amplify what I'm doing while also being good stuff? And, like, so um, that's where the copycat and mill idea comes from, right? Whereas, like, Nocturne is um, in better in 90% of other decks in that particular deck. Copycat would be better because now it's, it's 
close enough that it's accentuating. It's within that same tier. So, like, the little Rolodex, like, sort of goes until it fits, until I get the, like, three things in a row. And then I send it to some random top 100 player, and I'm like, yo, run this for me, and tell me if this is good. Any cost curve tips? How do you figure out your cost curve? How many... I mean, we don't run ones. But how many non-ones do you run? How many of each cost do you run? Are you looking for specific things? What's the plan? I don't know, man. Nebula's still so good, dude. People people, people underestimate Nebula all the time, man. Uh, dude, cart... This is going to sound annoying. It's kind of just vibes-based. Like, I, ha- I hate to say it. It's so vibes-based. How you want to like run your curve. And it kind of does come from just like a lot of practice of a lot of playing, like playing a lot of different decks. You, I could just kind of look at a deck and be like, there's certain turns where I'm just like, what, well, what the hell am I doing? Okay, well, I need mm-hmm. just like a good uh, card that I can play on here. I think the biggest thing, the other, like another thing to look at with cost curve cards is that there are cards that you are happy to play on curve and there are cards that you're almost never happy to play on curve. Uh, and, and if you don't think about that, you'll think like, oh, I have two, three drops in here. But those two three drops are Sage and Rogue. It's like, mm. how often are you ever playing Sage or Rogue on turn three? Pretty much never. So what are you doing on that turn? Do you have like enough other smaller cards to kind of fill that out? Are you okay with floating a mana or an energy here or there? So my biggest cost curve tip would be don't just look at the cost of each card that you're adding into the deck, but actually try and assess when you are playing that card uh, to think about how it fits into your game plan. Yeah, like just to jump off of that, imagine a perfect game with that deck. What does mm-hmm. that look like? What's your turn one? What's your turn two? Everything perfect. Lay out how much power you're putting on the board. Do you think that's enough to beat some of the other decks that you're trying to go up against? If, and then also think about what if I don't draw one of those cards? What does my what does my turn look like after that? Do I have a backup card? That's the sort of stuff you need to be thinking about. Like if I don't have Kitty. Like we were mentioning Hydra Bob, right? If I don't have Kitty, I need that one cost to kind of smooth out the Thena stuff. So you just play a Nightcrawler or something like that. So you have two one costs. You have to think about things like that. What does your core package look like? And does it need to have one cost? Does it need to have more six costs? Like a Pixie deck, you put a little bit more six costs because you have the potential to reduce more of those cards to play cheaper, et cetera, et cetera. So I write at least three turn by turns every single day. So like when I look at a deck, I can be like, I don't know what I'm doing on these three turns. And what I'm doing on these three turns is powerful enough. Just because like I know, like because I write so many of them, like like do what Ika said, figure out your turn by turn. But like if you're not capable of doing that as you're building a deck, try writing it down. Have a notepad app open and literally write turn one, I can do this or this. And like a lot of times turn one is just pass. That's fine. But if turn three is play something either really weak or pass that doesn't set up multiple options for power, powerful things later, you need to do something else with that spot. You need to figure out how you can change that deck to make more sense. Um, like, if your deck's two drops are Quake and US Agent, right? Like, you've made a mistake somewhere. Because those are both two drops, right? But they're two drops that you want to play later. So what are you doing on two? Maybe you're comfortable passing two, but I'd assume if you're playing those two other two cards, you don't want to. So now you're running, like, four twos, right? Because you, if you want to run both Quake and U.S. Agent, for whatever reason, if, um, now you're running, like, four twos because you need something else to do on two, which is going to tell us other things about the curve of your deck, right? Like, now you're running a lower curve deck because you're not running... Um, because now your twos have to fit into your curve later on, which means on turn five, you want to be playing a three and two are on turn six, you want to be playing a four and two, which means that maybe you're not looking at either a super important five or six drop for the deck, or maybe only one of those two cost spots gets a card that you really, really think is important to your game plan. So figuring out that kind of like dichotomy um, by writing out turn by turn and then letting that inform your later decisions. How do you determine what tech cards to run? Iki, you want to start? Uh, you have to you have to analyze what your weakness is. Always, if you have a weakness in your deck, tech cards fill those weaknesses. If you can afford to have a tech card, obviously. Sometimes you just build a deck and you're like, yeah, "That's the deck. It's the tight combo." Yolo. Um, uh, <laughs> but if you can afford to have a tech card, always fill in the weaknesses. For example, if you have a deck that dies to uh magic because you don't want to turn seven 
then put in something that changes the locations, right? Um, if you feel like you can't, don't, if you have small package, like small number cards, and you feel like you die to a large blob, put in chunk chi things like that. Yeah, I, th- I think it's, uh, I think it comes down to what decks are popular. Because, like, when Tribunal's 2% of the meta, or like 1% of the meta, you don't, you don't have to pop an enchantress in your deck to be tribunal you know like if it's if it's good against two if it like wins you the game against two percent of decks but just makes you worse against 98 percent of the decks it's just kind of whatever so it really just depends on what like the most common big techable threats are uh so right now we're in shang chi meta that was very interesting you know a few months ago we were in a meta where shang chi was at his lowest play rate in super super long time which was a very interesting meta to be in uh, and you there's not many people running shang chi so you could be a little bit more greedy so right now big giant scary monsters so uh i mean i mean like shang chi is just just very common um so so really just trying to assess what common counterable threats are there and then what what do i really want a answer to because my deck can't compete against it uh just like you said eco finding your weaknesses like my deck just could not compete if this counterable threat uh, gets played and this counterable threat is co- uh, common i should have a tech against it uh you also have to think about if the tech can fit into your deck which i think a lot of people don't like really do like when people were saying like oh you can run a nihilus as a tech card against junk decks no you can't you can't play a five cost tech like you just can't play really a five cost tech card against like something that happens in the matchup because where the, when the hell are you gonna play it on turn five like wh- what the hell is your deck doing if you're gonna play a tech card in turn five my legion does exist which kind of does that but that's more a, a big kind of thing so make sure that the the cards can run it if you can only for like fit in a cheap tech card like uh, shadow king can be really good um but i mean it just it just depends on, on identifying which decks uh you have troubles with that a tech card can help you against that are popular those are the those are like that's like the venn diagram of like the 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 tech cards that you want to slot uh into your deck and also like uh, like i said about like the tribunal thing be okay with losing to some decks it's like mm-hmm. marvel snap is a game where you can just say this is a very uncommon deck. If they have this thing, I'm going to lose. And that's okay. <laughs> and you guy can just retreat for one against that deck. It's not very common. So uh, at, all the time when I'm streaming, I will lose to one random deck. And people are like, you should add this card to your deck because mm-hmm. you lost to that one deck. And it's like, no, I shouldn't. I, I really, really shouldn't do that. That would be a very silly thing to do uh, just because you lost. So people could be really, rea- don't, yeah, a, another big, tip with tech cards don't add a tech card just because you lose to one deck on ladder uh they really think about like what this tech card brings to 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 the table other than oh it just beats this one deck that i might face maybe yeah so unless it's arisham also don't tech against one deck right like you can tech against arisham arisham's 30 percent of the meta but the next most popular thing is less than 10 percent, which mm-hmm. means one in 10 games and it's clock right like the next most popular thing you're seeing on ladder, I guess various dark hawk bullshit, Athena's up there too. But um the next most popular thing you're gonna see on ladder is going to be um less than ten percent. So figure out what tech card beats that next group, right? So like okay, so Clog is often weak to Shang Chi. Um let's pretend Irishman doesn't exist for the purpose of Clog is often weak to Shang Chi. We know that a lot of the other decks are running Dark Hawk, which is also often weak to Shang Chi, which can steal you cubes. That means if that's gonna be combined like 20% of the meta now all of a sudden Shang is a good shout Enchantress will stop Darkhawk too right and like you're like okay so maybe I can run Enchantress and not run Shang but those clog decks don't have anything and now Enchantress is a dead card try and think like holistically not just about like one again we're in a very strange place right now where Arishem is the most popular thing ever so you can just totally tech against one deck for now and be fine but generally speaking you want to sort of like try and keep an overview um there was a point for a while where um tribunal was still around and then that um that gene gray deck had started to show up right and like and at that point enchantress was an amazing call because you had those both of those were popular decks and now you had an answer for both those meanwhile rogue an ongoing answer would have been terrible because while it might be good against the tribunal decks where it can get an iron man or a tribunal and ruin everything it wasn't going to do anything against those other ongoing decks where it was just going to hit a random one and they were all sort of equivalent like figuring out which that is and how to do that in sort of clusters of decks is what you do after you figure out what you specifically want to target uh yeah go ahead do one small tip as well 
Mm-hmm. We do live in a low-key prominent meta. Make mm-hmm. sure the tech card you put in doesn't absolutely also dismantle <laughs> your own deck. Uh, that's mm-hmm. a very important tip. Loki is very common with Arishem and just in general as a Loki deck. Make sure it's not a tech card that absolutely completely kills your game plan. You, of course, it can counter your stuff. I mean, you can't avoid that always, but make sure it doesn't just completely ruin everything you're trying to build. I mean, follow up I- advice run more Mobius. <laughs> Don't run Mobius. Yeah. Be, be, be better. <laughs> uh, an interesting thing, too, is like uh, Loki with the, that's running Arishim a lot, but also like Doc Ock. Like, if you're running Darkhawk and like something mm-hmm. and like or Iron Man Darkhawk and you have Enchantress in your deck, they can Doc Ock that. And then you can, yep. it's, it, there's some real, I, dude, I had a Blob Shadow King get Darkhawk in the wrong, or it get uh, Doc Ock in the wrong order and it, it hurt. I've never been that hurt in Marvel Snap in a really <laughs> long time. I was just sitting there, just looking at my phone, like, "Why did I do that to myself, man? What am I? What am I thinking?" Yeah, Doc Ock. That card's getting nerfed real soon, huh? What do they do with it? I don't. Uh, <laughs> you make you it. you make it pull two cards or something like that. Uh, that was actually my idea, exact idea too. Make it pull two cards. It's kind yeah. kind of an interesting way to do. Yeah, like I think that's fine. It's balanced. You keep maybe you even give it an extra power. Have fun. If you tell someone in 2022 that Doc Ock's getting nerfed in the original state, they would <laughs> laugh at you so, so look, hard. Doc Ock wouldn't have to be nerfed if you could only play it on five and six turn games. If you can play it on five and seven turn games, or on um, four and six turn games, we have a problem. Mm-hmm. Same issue as Leech, more or less. Alright. Uh, you've got 90% of your decks set. You've even got a tech card for the meta. What do you do with the last spot or two spots? White Widow. <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah. you, said Mobius, you said Mobius, so funny. Um, Nocturne. Yeah. You, you just yeah. pick the best card in slot, right? At a cost curve you need. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, funny enough, yeah, kind of, yeah. I mean, like, you, you should probably experiment, play the mm-hmm. games have a flex slot, and then see if it was worth it to put in that card. And then if not, then try sure. something else. Sure, but like also, you're, how often are you sad that you stuck a Jeff or a White Widow in your deck? Yeah, but you should always also be looking if there is anything better. Yeah. Let's say, let's put it that way. That's right. I can live with that. Yeah, having those like one or two extra tech spots when you're, when you're doing it. And this is just like a general knowledge for people who are, maybe you net deck every single deck, you never build your own decks, which is okay. People mm-hmm. will be. People are very mean to people who do this because I did that for every other card game other than Marvel Snap. I used to hate building decks. I would just take other people's decks. I had a great time. It's totally okay to do that. But if you are interested in doing your own thing and you want something that is gratifying, Marvel Snap is the easiest game that I have ever played, and the, pretty much the only the easiest popular game where you can adjust one card in a deck that you find. Let's say you find this meta net deck. Find play it for ten games. See, is there a card you don't really love in the deck that's not super important? Swap that with a different card uh, to get the feel for what it's like, kind of crafting your own deck. Uh, there's so many reasons why it's awesome in Marvel Snap. First of all, you draw it seventy five percent of games, which is awesome. If you're playing Hearthstone or Magic the Gathering, you can go ten games and never draw that card. Or if you have luck like me, you do that in Marvel Snap anyway. But but if you're playing like a, another game like like Hearthstone or Magic the Gathering, you can go ten games without ever seeing that card. You have no idea what impact it makes. Every card you change in Marvel Snap is incredibly impactful, so you will immediately get a really cool impact from changing that card out. Uh, and uh, you will feel so good. Like, it, you will hit so many, your brain will produce so many happy chemicals. Mm-hmm. When the choice that you make to swap that card for a different card wins you a game because it comes in at the perfect time and counters something. So it, it is the easiest, I think, game to, to kind of start tweaking and start getting your creative juices flowing for for building your own decks and the, it's very easy you just find in that deck play it for 10 games swap one card out with a different card and you can immediately get uh, some satisfaction from it and then now that's your deck and you can yell at other people for playing your <laughs> deck and, and have ownership of it it's very cool yeah all decks are trademarked in Marvel's now. uh so two places to start if you're looking at just trying to like figure out where you can try things if you don't have anything you love to do on turn five and just like sometimes your turn six is a little awkward try a claw yeah claw is so good yeah. cube thief claw like i never do claw math like claw is my juggernaut um where like 
I'll be like, all right, so I play, uh, you, like, what, uh, I don't remember what rule number it is, you die to doom, but, like, Mm -hmm. I I never think you die to claw. (laughs) Guess what? (laughs) I died to claw. Like, Mm -hmm. oh, shit, that's eight. Oh, shit, that's eight. Like, claw is really good at that. Um, Legion is amazing at that. I mean, it kind of, uh, kind of goes off of that point and what Binks was saying, like, taking net decks and swapping cards. Remember, there's also a strategic... Uh, advantage you have if you change one or two cards in an, a deck that is very common yeah. because guess what when you're playing against someone they're going to be like oh they run the whatever jeff and then you hit them with quake and they're like oh my god i didn't know and then you win the eight cubes right mm-hmm. there is a strategic uh, advantage into swapping some cards out here and there yeah 100 percent. i used to run some junk decks and just cut a lion because my opponent would just retreat if they would die to a Lyoth, so I could just use that deck spot for something else. There is some really funny things that you can do when like me- there's so such meta tyrants that people will just always respect because they know you have it. So th- there's some really funny things that you can do to like find ways to put tech cards in because you just know that they're gonna leave uh, if they get beat by that card and they think you have it, but uh, I don't have that card. That's part of the frustration for Arisham, right? Because you're like, because they have it, and you're like, but he shouldn't. Right, excuse me, but they shouldn't. They should not have the card that they need in this Arisham deck right now. They shouldn't. The odds of them drawing it after they Loki'd, after this happened, are so low. And then when they do, there's like that extra like stab. And it's you like, click oh. it and you see created by Arisham on yep. it. And then you want to I, I, the no, I lost 16 cubes in a row to generated Kyra's. Because the first <laughs> time I didn't remember Kyra fucking existed. And then the second time I was like, there's no fucking way this next opponent also generated Kyra. They also generated Kyra. That's what he... Also, there's something wrong with how often those decks see Quinjet on one. There's no way that can be mathematically accurate. Uh, it's just bias, man. It, it, it happens the exact amount of times it's supposed to. You just feel a lot worse uh, when it does. Fair. Because it is. It's, and it's hard. I, mean, I, ta- I talk about this all the time. It just happens exactly how much it does, and it just, it just feels yeah. really bad because you you if those ones just dig at you, and you're like, Ugh. like, can you just miss one? Ugh. One day, one uh, one day, yesterday, on in Deadpool's diner, an opponent dropped Quinjet Quinjet on turn one. <laughs> I I just ran. I was like, I don't care what you have. It's you're playing good, though, negative right? two energy for the rest of the game with negative two cost to your cards at plus one energy. Fuck you. You win. Have a great day. <laughs> Uh, all right. Uh, any final thoughts about deck building? Let us build something. So we're gonna choose um either a card, new, unreleased, whatever you want, or a card changed by the OTA. Any preference? Anyone have a card that they're dying to build for? Next week's card. Oh, next week's card doesn't exist. We could even go a couple weeks in advance and do either Hawkeye or uh, Marvel Boy. Or we can go back and do Copycat or uh, even Ajax. We could do Viper. I want to build a Lockjaw deck. A Lockjaw deck? I can do a Lockjaw deck. I hmm. tried playing Thanos Lockjaw. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something that might be controversial. I think Lockjaw can go back to 3-2 with the exact same stats and it would not be that big of an issue. <laughs> I do not think it would be an issue. I, I might be completely wrong there, but like it, it is just if um, as a four cost card, even with like the the restriction gone, I, I think that at the time and when Thanos didn't have the Quicksilver nerf, like it was very warranted what they did. I I think the power level has risen now enough that it could go. It could go back to Wolf. Like you remember when this three two Wolf was the menace, and now the yeah. only person who thinks it's good is is Glazer over here. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> It's literally just me. Opponents <laughs> drop Wolf against me, and I'm like, who the fuck? Who told you? Who told you this? Oh, probably me. Um, Gnome. Gnome also plays Wolf. Alright, uh, okay, so are we gonna try Lockjaw Thanos? Let's do it. We can do it. What about non-Thanos Lockjaw? Not yeah, Thanos? Yeah, something, there's some other uh, Lockjaw. Do we wanna, okay. So, if we're not doing Thanos, now we're sort of Rolodexing things. The next thing to ask is, do we want to try and do Thor stuff or ramp stuff? I think ramp with Lockjaw doesn't feel great. Um, I mean, I, I mean, obviously, ramp. like you could be thinking about ramp stuff, like um, 
like just trying to play small stuff to get big things, right? Not necessarily like right. That's what I with, meant. I didn't mean like Electro. Like a classic random deck. I meant like can... Psylocke and what's his name? Oh, Zabu. And then you're just sort of like looking at trying to get locked out early, and then yeah, I don't know if that works anymore. That used to be fun. The first deck I tried with Lockjaw's new Lockjaw was like the classic Lockjaw discard where mm. you get a bunch of swarms and you try to cycle the swarms through there. Um, that was fine. <laughs> it was not great yeah. in this meta, but remember before Modoc, that's what just people did I've to cycle a sh- bunch of discards. Strange question. Does Thor's work with High Evolutionary? Uh, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> like, could you do Thor's Lockjaw Evolutionary? Could we? Trying to yeah, list. of course uh, um, we could. That sounds the, cool. The, the I was like, the, I, he's, he definitely like, I, I'm doing text the thing on where, his... like, all the different hey. things that go in Lockjaw just sort of cycle in my brain. You know what I mean? And it's like, all right, does this fit? Does wasp. this fit? Yeah. yeah, like, Wasp is Wasp is a connector, right? And then, like, you can run Jane, which will also hit you the Wasp that can also win the Lockjaw. And you don't have to run 15 Evolutionary cards. You run two, three. You couldn't run fifteen evolution cards if you tried, man. The game would the game that, would that, but the game would break immediately. Yeah. You're cheap. Okay, so what? So what are we? Th- so we would. I, I I actually I'm I'm really digging this idea. So are you gonna like build it on like what? What's... So I, so we're just gonna have to talk through. So I'm gonna start with the cards that are obviously in the package. So we're gonna say wasp, um, both Thor's Thor Beta Ray and Jane. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Lockjaw, Lockjaw, and then High That's Evolutionary. Mm-hmm. And then we j- and then probably Hulk. Yeah, because otherwise, what the hell's the point of high evolutionary? Really? Mm-hmm. Uh, I like okay. Cyclops a lot. I could see Cyclops. I'm always. I, I, I think. I Cyclops. think that if you're playing a high evolutionary deck and you're not including Cyclops, I think it's probably mm-hmm. just there's no reason not to, right? Or there's no reason to be playing high evolutionary then. So I kind of yeah, like. I kind of like slotting Cyclops in there. Also, on three, you often do get that weird turn of like, if you don't have Thor, what the hell am I doing with that deck? Oh, like very, very often. So it kind of gives us a, a optional yeah. second card. And you're totally fine if it comes out of the lockjaw lane, too. Okay. Is it... I don't know if I like this or not. This is a spitball. Is it insane to run, like, a magic She-Hulk Infinite here? I like mm-hmm. Infinite Infinite, Infinite, you can. I yeah. don't know if I like She-Hulk. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. If I like it. Okay, so let's two, try Two it. small stuff. We're going to start with Infinite, and then we can go from there. So our deck so far, we have three spots left. Infinite is obviously on the chopping block. We're going Wasp, Thor, Cyclops, Lockjaw, High Evolutionary, Beta Ray Bill, Thor, Jane, Infinite, and Hulk. And you said that's nine cards total? That's nine. But we have no two drops and no one drops. Yeah, we need a one drop, I think. At least you want somebody to cycle if you can get out the Lockjaw on four. Would that be Misty? Is Shocker insane here? I think Shocker actually has a lot of Sunspot is probably the better choice because if you pull it out of yeah. the Lockjaw, you don't feel bad. I don't mind Shocker in this version. Well, yeah, because if you Shocker, you get a Cyclops. Like you get a Cyclops for two, a Lockjaw for three. High Evolutionary is a three six is fine. Beta Ray Bill is a three six. But don't you think then Psylocke is just better at that point? Because at least you you can also get the Lockjaw synergy. I can see Psylocke being better. Also, Psylocke is at worst an extra energy for our Hulk Cyclops. Mm-hmm. You you I mean you do get uh, I mean you do get the shocker with lockjaw too because it, it's a on reveal right so you can put it through the lockjaw lane and yeah. this kind of something but yeah uh, is, maybe is you are right both? now that's now that Psylocke's two it's probably just better um is it not both um no it's probably not both we got yeah it's just so weird with lockjaw at four right because like yeah. if if you're playing out lockjaw on four or maybe like at this, this with this deck you're fine just playing it on six. Do you find just playing yeah. Lockjaw and just shucking everything that you can yeah. through Lockjaw on six in a lane? So it also, Psylocke also gives us the opportunity to just like drop a Beta Ray Bill on three or mm-hmm. drop a Cyclops on three that immediately triggers. I, I like either or. I, I you know, I want to play Shocker because it's a high evolutionary card. But if, if Psylocke was a 2 1, I would say Shocker is the definite pick. When there's only a one power difference, I think Psylocke is just more flexible. Okay. So. Okay. No. I don't think we want. Did, did you put we don't Sunspot want in? I, no. I I'm don't think thinking we want. Infinite, I don't think we want Sunspot. The more I'm thinking about how this deck would run. I think if we'd we'd rather need, have if we run Sunspot, I feel like we would need magic. And Yeah. 
Why do you just feel so feels bad with Nocturne almost every deck? Doesn't Red Hulk just make more sense than Infinite? Um, could be also be Odin. It's twice as powerful. So, yes, but the second we draw Infinite instead, we have no way to do anything with it outside of that. True. True. Like, I I want something big there, but I don't... Then, then yeah, in that case, you would need magic to skip on right. six and then play Infinite. And then we need Infinite and She-Hulk, and then what's the point of lock? And then, then yeah, you're just being a high Evo deck, yeah. <laughs> Although, if we're magic... We have an extra turn if we don't see Jane to just draw our fucking hammers. Also mm-hmm. true. I still think you want Jane because Jane is still just a good ass card to come yeah, out yeah. of Lockjaw. Oh, you definitely it's just want nine power. It would be an um, addition. Okay, it's so just if you don't see Jane, you're not like ah. I I don't mind having magic. I don't. I, I like. I don't think I want. Magic. Maybe you're right without. Maybe you're right without Infinite. It's Infinite. I mean, it's obviously like a really big card when it comes out, but. When it doesn't, it just kind of feels bad. I don't mind Doom. I think Doom is kind of like a surprise, like really good pick uh, for these Doom. Lockjaw decks. You can even put it through the Lockjaw on the final turn if you're like yeah. scared that five power isn't enough, which is kind of kind of interesting when it comes down to that. So we could just top end with like Red Hulk, regular Hulk, Doom at six. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So we have with... a bunch of really good bombs. Which is going to leave us one cost. Uh, the other question is, is Red Hulk better than um, running Eliath? Or is Red Hulk... Well, yeah, okay, because we don't want Pryo, right? Because of uh, the hammers. Or yeah. running Odin for hammers. Mm-hmm. We also have Doom in the deck now, which could pop out a lock draw. What's the deck list right now? Are we at 11 cards? We are at, we are at 11. It's Wasp. Psylocke, Thor, Cyclops, uh, Lockjaw, Haivo, Beta Ray, Jane, Red Hulk, Green Hulk, and Doctor Doom. I think we'd probably want something cheap. Cheap, yeah. You need something. You need a two or one. Not just Jeff. You know, you kind of do need something that comes out that you can move away. Probably, maybe I don't know. But how much stuff you cycling that you're gonna clog up your? Lockjaw lane, anyways. So if you get enough hammers, but like that's at the end of the game anyway, right? I would, I would want. Uh, I think I would want Nightcrawler over Jeff. I weirdly, just because it's love. one, it's something uh, that we can Hydra squeeze Bob. in. I, I, you know, I almost laughed because I was thinking through it, but do you want to put Hydra Bob through? He's actually he's fine coming out. Like, like, it's you're a fine funny. It's a much funnier out, thing to right? say. It's a much funnier play. All right, we have to do Hydra Bob. Okay, let's put. Are you cool with that? Is everyone, <laughs> that's, yeah, okay? Let's do it. It's thematic. All right, yeah, so the final card. 12 is Wasp, Hydra Bob, which is amazing in a high evolutionary deck, which has like three one drops. It could run. <laughs> Fuck it, Hydra Bob. Um, Psylocke, Cyclops, Thor, Beta Ray Bill, High Evolutionary. And remember your. Uh, Dear listener, you're psylocking for either extra cyclops, uh, cyclops energy to get beta ray bill or to get lockjaw. Otherwise, you might be better off holding that to throw into lockjaw later. Um, high evolutionary lockjaw, Jane Foster, Doctor Doom, Hulk, and Red Hulk. We all happy with that list? That sounds awesome. I don't yeah, know how I, I don't know how successful it can be. I'm sure if you snap well with that deck, you could hit infinite with it though. I'd yeah, I would. What. I would assume this deck is a high cube rate deck that like sometimes is just going to like poop itself. (laughs) But like, I think that like if you draw reasonably well and play reasonably well, you should win a lot of cubes with this list. And you get a, you get a, uh, have a reason to play that you, that you bought a Hydra Bob, you know, Hydra Bob is good. good Like Hydra Bob pops out of Lockjaw on turn four on turn five. And you're just like, well, better snap. That sounds amazing. <laughs> that sounds like the most fun gameplay in Marvel Snap. <laughs> I wish uh, there was more like weird, weird cards like that that interact with different aspects of the game. Like Snap makes you move. Like I wish there was more stuff like that. There will be eventually. It is a heavy cost to pay to Snap to move, Bob. I tell you what. It yeah, feels, it is. It That's what makes it fun. It. All right. We have officially built a deck. We are on to right. 
every, each and every week, our last major segment is Variant of the Week. So we have three variants of the week for our girl Hazmat, a card like near and dear to my heart, one of my the OG combo cards of Marvel Snap. Love Hazmat. All right, so we'll start over here on the right. Who picked sort of, I don't know, which version of Hazmat that is? Like, I think it's one of the alternate universe Hazmats. Uh, like who picked Hazmat? Apocalypse future. Survivor Mommy Hazmat. Uh, yeah. Apocalypse Survivor Mommy Hazmat. <laughs> Binks, is that who you picked? It is indeed. I This has been, I mean, this card has been in the, or this variant has been in, in the game since beta. It's one of the very first variants I pulled. Uh, I just think the coloring on it is great. When you see the animation and everything like that, it's just uh, it's just really solid. You know, it's one of those just um, I don't exactly know why particularly like this this uh, variant speaks to me, uh, but it's probably like my top twenty variants just overall in the game. It's just very good artwork, a very interesting kind of look and take on a character that's like. It, you know, in a lot of ways, supposed to be this kind of like almost like high tech looking, like with the full suit and everything like that. But you know, this version is like kind of a more ragtag, apocalyptic kind of version, just just trying to make things work. Um, just really, really cool stylist uh, uh, variant that that I love. So I I run this one because the one I like isn't in the game yet. Uh, <laughs> this one is a cross between a ninja and an Assassin's Creed character, right? Like it's it's so cool looking. All right. I believe the one on the left here is not in the game. Is this the one you were talking about, Glazer? It is not in the game. I think it's Ink yeah. Pulp. Is that Ink the artist? Mm -hmm. All right. So did anyone besides Glazer pick Ink Pulp here? Well, you sort of. I sort but, of uh, did, but Yeah. So I, uh, when this comes out, I think I'm going to trade in my Assassin's Creed hazmat for it. Largely because... um. I think that has met. I want to see what the hell that looks like animated. I think that's just going to look really, really great. I like the contrasting colors. I like, um, as discussed last week, yellow is my favorite color. But, um, <laughs> but this has met, like the way it pops with the contrasting colors, I think is really, really great. It's also a little more cartoony, and I tend to really like cartoony art and Marvel Snap, even though I don't in comics. But I really, really like cartoony art stuff. I would describe it as stylized. Like, I prefer the Marvel Snap ones that have, like, a clear artist style, even if it's not, like, one of the, like, famous artists, like Pete Tomoko or whatever. Um, it's, like, very clearly, like, stylized and, like, not pulled from the Marvel art archive, which some of the both variants and for all characters and the default art, it just feels like, I don't know, it's in the Marvel Bible. I, I really do like this one. But the middle one... The real taste, the real enjoyer, the Pixel one, which was one of the two that I did name here. So why is the Pixel one great? Okay. Just as a preface, Pixels get way too much hate. Agreed. Pixel art was what brought me into this game. I uh, There was an advertisement that had Pixel art of all the Marvel characters. And I was like, whoa, whoa, Pixel Marvel game? That's cool. Eh, not like that. But, you know, <laughs> uh, this is this is cool. This is one of the better Pixels for sure. Um, mm -hmm. kind of got that same as vibes as well. If you if you played uh, mm -hmm. some of those old NES games, uh, it's it's got a nice 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 background too. Pixel variants usually have a kind of a sh a bad background usually, <laughs> and this one has something going on at least. Um, it it pops out. I don't know. It, it it looks great. It's visually nice, and it screams hazmat to me. I like pixel variants. That's it. <laughs> yeah, no, like I agree. This character. Uh, That's all I, I got. I also think that the pixels have been getting better. Like compare like the early pixels to this like later one of Hazmat or like the Gambit pixel is also oddly like really good. Um, like I just think they I think when the game started, most pixels were either memes or horror stories. There were a few good ones, but like <laughs> I think over time they've kind of found a sweet spot where you're not necessarily unbelievably upset if you pull a pixel out of your random bundle, but uh, maybe true pixel enjoyers like us are the only ones who will say that. But <laughs> that brings us fully to the end of an episode where we thank our guests for joining us. So, Binks, thank, uh, really appreciated having you on. If our loyal listeners and loyal viewers were to become your loyal listeners and loyal viewers, what would they find in your content uh, besides Marvel Rivals, which I believe you've been 
playing a lot of so uh recently uh yeah i play almost exclusively uh marvel snap uh on twitch sometimes i play a couple other games here and here but the the youtube channel you'll find uh both you can watch me fully live on youtube and on twitch on uh, the youtube channel you'll find full breakdowns of the different decks that i play a nice clean little intro and then some of the best games of them uh, i try and do things differently i try and make uh unique decks they're not all good i tell you what they're not all good but i t- uh, but every single time you go there and watch me play a deck you're gonna have a lot of fun uh we, we try and have a lot of fun with marvel snap uh, we try and love losing. We try and just really enjoy the game. Marvel Snap is one of my favorite games that has ever existed. Uh, if you're looking for someone who truly, actually enjoys uh, every second that they play Marvel Snap, I can tell you I'm probably one of the very few people who, who really do because I, I just truly love win or lose or however I'm doing in the game. I, I just think that this game is awesome and there's so much to uh, uh, to have with it. So come check me out. Uh, YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, Binks underscore plays. And I'll see you there. So Bing's content, well, hey, he's very, very charming. There's a few creators that are big, and you just meet them, and you're like, fuck, you're char-. Like, it's uh, the other two that I think of this way are Nina and Educated Collins. Just, like, charming-ass human beings where you meet them, and you're like, wow, there's no question why you're so successful, because it's very charming. But there's also, like, a joy and a pleasure in gaming that happens over on Binx's Twitch. I've been spending a lot of time on his Twitch stream lately. I watch the YouTube videos, but I've like been hanging out on the Twitch stream more. And like there's um Binx sits generally um in the top like hundred to two hundred of the infinite leaderboard, at least as I've been watching <laughs> and lately. Right? Um and generous. Lot, uh, that's where I've seen it. But uh look when I, when we play each other, that's a little number next to your name too, so you can't fool me. But um uh, there's a pressure a lot of top players put on themselves or a like I must do this and they get really frustrated and I like I'm not saying that never happens right but that's not the tone of big stream it's really joyous and laid back there's an understanding of that this is a game and this is fun and we're enjoying this together and it's really heartwarming because um <laughs> dear Marvel Snap community members this game can get bogged down in a lot of negativity and while Binx is not immune to that or going to lie to you. There is a general joy and positivity to the content that I think Marvel Snap could really use more of. So go check them out. Thank you, Glazer. That's very kind. Absolutely. Yeah, right, you All right. Well, you guys, thank you so much for joining us today. So if our loyal listeners and loyal viewers would become your loyal listeners and loyal viewers. What would they find on your stream? Um, I am the most hipster <laughs> Marvel Snap streamer <laughs> in the game. I as soon as a deck becomes meta, I don't play it. I hate it. <laughs> I try to, but no, seriously though, I just try to bring uh, to my viewers some interesting stuff that I think if you want to see. The best decks get played optimally. You go watch, uh, you know, KM Best or uh, all those big streamers who play the best stuff optimally. I try to come up with interesting ideas. We do try to break the meta sometimes. We try, do try to come up with a really solid deck for the meta. But I like cooking. I like interacting with the chat, coming up with ways we can swap some cards. We, I, I, It's a very interactive stream. So if you like that kind of stuff, if you like cooking, if you like enjoying funny deck ideas and heck, heck i have a whole thing you can redeem where you force me to play agatha so there you go if you get bored you can just force me to play agatha all the time <laughs> uh so that's what that's what you can find on my streams and that's usually what i do if you subscribe to Ika, you get to follow the real slim shady all the <laughs> other slim shadies are just imitating uh no Ika is so he's very humble but he's broken the metal like four or five different times um there was that deck that Cam popularized, like in that Leech meta, that was running um, not the one that ran Domino, the one that ran um, Claw, it ran and Blink with Leech. That was Ika's deck. Um, like he just breaks the meta every so often. He came up with this completely ridiculous. Um, it maintained like a sixty-seven percent win rate for multiple seasons. Uh, Darkhawk Scar thing. Remember that deck? Uh, just like, but. Just he regularly comes up with completely distinct decks that 
most people don't know they came from him, but they came from him and they're stellar. And like as he's brewing them, there's all sorts of hilarity as creation is often a completely wild process, but it is genuinely a joy. Um this summer, I've been spending most of my mornings, whether I'm actively speaking or not, while I set up for the videos, uh, hanging out in the history and giggling. Mostly at the hair, though, so. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. Love having you in my chat. <laughs> A pleasure. All right, now is everybody's favorite segment of every episode, mine in particular, which is where Glazer is going to read every single one of our patrons in as few breaths as possible. So let's see how many it takes him now, because our patron list is growing each and every week. I'd like to say thank you to Abigail Gisla, Meditor Burnout, Cables, Matt H, Irregardless, David G. Wingfield, Dyrolf, LAB, Father Newman, Good Dog Gamer, This Is The Way, Inc., I Am Frostman, Jane Every, Corbin, Prime Brian, Caretix Lee, Corey, Perro, Frost, The Goat Secret, Demon Falcon, Quick Rojo, Doc D, Fat Nick, Ginger Prime, Philip Rackwich, Haplo, Kenny Loggins of the Danger Zone, Rob Silverman, The Visit, Extra Scene, Skippy G, Winners, Not Jones League, Season 1, Tommy Nyquist, The King of Bros, Black Dolly, Great Kazoo, Jessica Gamble, Ryan Wood, Cuffs, Yoda, Ludacris, Ain't Archangel 3K, John Q, Louis Antonez, Monster Premium Models, Darth Vader, Ramis Atala, Brian Kaufman, Tristan H. Martin, Jason B, J.D. McDonald, Ian Hoke, The Fuzzy and Lump, Spectrum X, Poot, Matt H, yes, there are two of them, DJ, Mikey Hedgings, No Flex, Ocularis, Craig Starry, Seamus, Spike Jones, Two Ties, the goat lauren whatevs the pirate king tucker the homie man and of course gunny t where the t stands for roy take us out of here all right final goodbyes Ika, thank you so much for joining us this week we're sorry that you were in the infamous lost episode but we're glad to have you for a legitimate one that will hit our feeds thank you thank you again this was a pleasure roy glazer thanks what a what a what a fun what a fun podcast episode thank you thank you thank you Binks, thank you for joining us this week. We really appreciate having you on. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is a lot of fun. I love talking about Marvel Snap and hanging out with cool people who like Marvel Snap too. So thanks so much for having me. And uh, yeah, subscribe to the Patreon so we can make Pulse Glazer take even more breaths when he has to do it. <laughs> Pretty please. I for- firmly agree, friends. Uh, Aaron, thank you for joining me for yet another episode uh, of all new snap judgments. It is one of the joys of my life to do this show with you each and every week. Peace and love everybody. All right, friends. Well, thanks for joining us for another effing busted episode (laughs) of all new snap judgments until next week. Make good choices, stay safe and keep on snap.